The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good morning, everyone. So we have a, a singleton lecture today on linear programming which is a general purpose optimization technique that you can use to solve a whole bunch of problems, including ones that we've seen uh, in 6046 and previously in 006. Uh, and most recently, we looked at max flow. Uh, we wouldn't have had to go through all of that pain we went through uh, to derive a max flow algorithm if uh, you had a linear programming package handy and all you wanted to do was find the optimum solution, you could have just run the linear program with an appropriate input, of course, that is derived from the flow network, and uh, you'd get your optimal solution. And we'll spend a couple of minutes on that as we look at the power of linear programming uh, in today's lecture. But it's not just max flow. You could do shortest paths. You could do multi-commodity max flow, which is more complicated than max flow and a variety of other problems. Um, so, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that the algorithms for linear programming are a heck of a lot more complicated than max flow. Um, and you can imagine that that would be the case because it's a more general purpose and more powerful technique. Um, the history really is that it was an open problem. Up until 1979, uh, people did not know if linear programming was polynomial time solvable until uh, Kachian came up with this ellipsoid method. And uh, then there's been, there's been progress since. But the algorithm we're going to describe today uh, and execute on an example input is a simplex algorithm, the simplex algorithm, that uh, runs in worst case exponential time. But it's uh, very efficient in practice, and uh, uh, it's uh, held its ground, uh, even with the advent of uh, a more efficient, from a theoretical sense, polynomial time algorithms, namely the, uh, the ellipsoid method, which actually is not that efficient uh, in practice, and uh, new interior point methods. So a little bit of context. Uh, let's just dive into uh, an example of uh, optimization in the context of uh, politics and see how you could formulate this particular problem as a linear program. Right? So how, how does politics work? You buy elections. Right? So you don't want to spend a lot of money. So you want to minimize the amount of money that is required to buy an election. And uh, the way you buy an election is, well, campaign, but you advertise. And it doesn't matter, facts are irrelevant, as long as uh, you get to the right uh, demographic with the right message, let's assume that you're going to win the election. Right? So that's our mathematical abstraction of uh, campaigning and politics all in 30 seconds. So how to campaign to win an election? And as I said, uh, we're going to advertise. But you do have uh, a little bit of work to do here. That's why you need your campaign manager. And uh, this manager is going to estimate votes obtained per dollar spent. Okay, But that dollar is spent advertising in support of a particular case or a particular issue. And contradictions are allowed. As long as you're sending different messages to different demographics, you're all good, right? <laughs> um, you're assuming that people don't watch more than one channel. All right? So you're a Fox News guy, you're an MSNBC, MSNBC guy. You don't do both. Okay? 
so, so now we get uh, this estimate, and it turns into a table. And so you have your policy, and you got your demographic. So you got urban. Now think Detroit, suburban. I guess you can think Lexington, where I live, and rural. I really don't have any idea what that means, but <laughs> but presumably there's places. Uh, and here's our policy, right? You want to build roads, right? Kind of boring, but some people are interested in roads. Gun control, oh, very sensitive. Farm subsidies, you know who's interested in that. And gasoline tax, kind of more, this is, hits your pocket, so more or less everybody's interested in that. Okay? So um, you tell the urban guys you want to build roads, and they don't like you. Right? So you get a minus two there. So this can go, you advertise, and it hurts you. You lose votes. Okay? Um, tell the suburban people, well, typically it's a, it's, it's a situation where uh, you have these nice cars and you don't like potholes, so you like roads if you live in suburbia. Rural people have four by fours, they don't particularly care, they don't care as much. Okay? Gun control, well, you can imagine the urban people like that. Suburban people are, mm, okay, meh. And the rural people hate it, right? You don't want, you do not want to advertise on gun control in the rural areas, right? Farm subsidies, it's like, don't want to deal with that. What is a farm? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and the rural people love it, right? So, uh, and then gasoline tax, uh, well, urban people are commuting. Uh, uh, and, well, they typically don't have a lot of money, so there you go. And those are the numbers. I'm not going to justify every number here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but you can put whatever numbers you want. I mean, so let's move on, right? This is just a table. Uh, you could have positive numbers, you could have negative numbers. Uh, and uh, you still want to win this election. Regardless of how crazy the demographics are, how crazy your uh, electorate is, right? You want to win the election. So as long as you have a great campaign, ma campaign manager who can uh, get you this table, it's all mathematical here on out, okay? You just got to figure out uh, how you're going to win a majority. And you could argue that all you want is, uh, uh, is to uh, win the election. Uh, we're going to do something slightly different, which is... Uh, something that's obviously going to guarantee victory, but you want to win a majority in every demographic. Right? Because the tables may be uh, off by a little bit, uh, you want to be careful. So uh, the last thing, of course, in order to estimate how much money you need, is the population here. So that's... Uh, a, Votes obtained per dollar spent, right? So you're getting, uh, it's 10 bucks a vote, it's uh, uh, five bucks a vote, it's, et cetera. And so we need to translate that to, to votes because that's uh, the dollars. And you got your population here corresponding to each of these areas. And that's what you got here. The majority, we'll assume. You win in the case of ties, just to keep these numbers easy. So that's just divided by two. Okay? So that's what you got so far. And you want to win by spending the minimum amount of money. So that's our optimization problem. So we can take this and we can convert it to a set of linear equations. 
And that's going to create our linear program, our first linear program. Um, and this is our algebraic setup. And so let, we need some variables here. So let x1, x2, x3, x4 denote the dollars spent per issue. So you got those four issues up there. Uh, so let me write that out. It's important to uh, make sure we, you know what I'm talking about with respect to a particular issue. So those are our four issues, and uh, those are our four variables. So this linear program has uh, four variables. You're trying to discover the values of these variables to optimize, minimize your cost function. The second thing that the linear program has, and pretty much the only other thing a linear program has, uh, are constraints. And, and these constraints are also linear. Okay. It gets much more complicated if you have um, quadratic constraints, and we won't go there. Uh, these constraints that I'm going to write correspond to this statement here that says you want a majority in each demographic. So you can imagine that because you have three demographics, you're going to have three constraints. Okay. You could have written this differently. There's just any number of variants here, and you'll get the sense of that as we go to other examples. But we'll just stick to one variant here. So now I want to translate everything that I've written in English over there into algebra. And so I got my minimization criterion, minimize x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, subject to minus 2x1 plus 8x2 plus 0x3 plus 10x4 greater than or equal to 50,000. And this represents the requirement that I want a majority in the first demographic, namely the urban demographic. And so I want at least 50,000 votes there. And I need to spend the money corresponding to the values of x1 through x4 in such a way that I get the, those 50,000 votes. And that represents that. And it's just reading off the minus 2, uh, 8, 0, and 10 uh, from the urban column. So those numbers that you see here correspond to the column, right? because I'm talking about the urban demographic. And you can imagine that the next constraint is going to correspond to the middle column and the third to the third. Right? So just write that out. I uh, will call this constraint constraint number 1. I might refer to it later. 5x1 plus 2x2 plus 0x3 plus 0x4 greater than or equal to 100,000, call this number 2. And then finally, 3x1 minus 5x2 plus 10x3. OK? And uh, that's our set of constraints. But there's one more little issue that we have to be careful about if you're being precise, and that is that there's no notion of unadvertising. Um, and so I, you're going to spend uh, positive dollars, uh, and it's x1 through x4 is greater than or equal to 0. Okay? So that's our first linear program. Um, and it came from this particular problem. It'd be wonderful, and that's exactly what we're going to do for the rest of the lecture. Uh, if we could uh, solve this linear program and any possible linear program in an efficient way. And so the number of variables is small n. And you can imagine that the number of constraints here, just talking about these constraints, um, are m constraints. And you certainly want a runtime that is polynomial in n. Okay, uh, That's our goal here. And as I mentioned early on, I was unclear for the longest time, well, at least until 1979, but people have been thinking about it for a long time before that, as to whether 
there was a general algorithm that would solve any linear program in time polynomial in n. And that was resolved in 79 by Kashyan. Um, we'll look at an algorithm a simplex that, uh, in the worst case, runs exponential in n, but is simpler to describe and is very efficient in, in practice. So I, in our particular problem, uh, this one, I, it turns out you, and I'm actually going to come back to this in a second, but um, I will just tell you that uh, the optimum for this um, particular linear program with these particular numbers correspond to these numbers here. So you want to spend um, uh, something of the order of uh, uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars for so there's a hundred here. So take away the 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 the, the two zeros. So uh, spend something of the order of uh, twenty thousand dollars for the first issue, uh, building roads. Uh, spend uh, a bit of money for the second issue. Ignore the third corresponding to farm subsidies, and um, spend a bit of money for the gasoline tax issue. And these numbers aren't important other than the fact that they happen to be optimum. Right? So if you add up these numbers, uh, then x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 um, is something of the order of $21,000, uh, $27,000, excuse me, though I'm writing it out as this, uh, this fraction. Right. So important consideration here is that um, these values xi are real numbers. That's it. It's not that they have to be integral. Right? Uh, they clearly, there were fractions here for the optimum, some of them anyway. Uh, but in general, linear programming says the variable values are real. Okay? There's also integer linear programming, which is NP complete, which adds the additional constraint that the xi values are integral. Right? So it turns into a harder problem. Um, you've got polynomial time solvable if the xi are real. You've got NP complete, uh, which uh, Eric is going to talk about on Thursday, uh, if um, uh, the values are forced to be integral. So this extra constraint makes things worse from a complexity standpoint. Right? We won't talk about ILP anymore for the rest of this lecture. So I will come back to this, and uh, I'll talk about how uh, we can show that this is optimum without actually going into uh, a deep algorithmic dive. But what I want to do just before that is to give you the general formulation of uh, a linear program. Uh, it's called uh, the standard form in uh, CLRS, also called the general form in some cases. We'll Look at uh, the standard form for LP. And I, I want to pop up a level a, a, above this example and give you the general setting. And we'll focus in on the general setting for the most part. But what I have here is I can either minimize or maximize. We had a minimization problem for the politic, uh, political problem. Minimize a linear objective function subject to linear inequalities or equations. And the variables Think of x as a vector. It's a column vector, or x1, x2, all the way to uh, xn. And the objective function is c times x. So that's uh, C1, X1, da-da-da, uh, Cn, Xn. 
and we just had uh, all the coefficients being a one over there. And the uh, inequalities, they're the fun part. Uh, you represent them. Uh, you can represent them as a, as a matrix A. So A times X less than or equal to, to B. And notice that uh, this is the standard form that I'm talking about. And now I have diverged from uh, what I had here because I had greater than or equal to over here. Right? So um, it turns out you'll see linear programs in different settings. Uh, sometimes you'll have minimization. Sometimes you'll have maximization. Uh, sometimes you'll have less than constraints less than or equal to constraints. Sometimes you'll have greater than or equal to constraints. Sometimes you'll have equality constraints. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about how you can transform um, any given linear program into a standard form. Right? So our standard form um, is going to be um, something that maximizes the objective function. Right? So these are our inequalities, and they're represented as less than or equal to. That's the standard form. And uh, uh, you want to maximize um, C times X, again, max for standard, such that uh, this, these set of inequalities hold uh, AX less than or equal to B and um, X greater than or equal to 0. Okay? So for each of the values, that correspond to the variables, you want these variables to be non-negative in the standard form. And you want less than or equal to corresponding to each of the inequalities, not equal to, not greater than or equal to, but less than or equal to. And you have this linear cost function where you could have arbitrary coefficients, but uh, you're maximizing it. OK? So that's it. Uh, so it's all about polarities, not much more than that. It's just about polarities. And if you might, if you get uh, a linear program, a specific linear program that doesn't conform to this, uh, we'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about conversions, and it's going to be fairly straightforward. Right? may not be immediately obvious, but uh, we'll get to that. Um, any questions so far? OK. So um, I want to go back to this uh, claim here, where I said this was optimum. Okay. Now, without actually describing an algorithm to you, I'm going to be able to show you, convince you, that this value here, corresponding to uh, whatever it is, 3 million, 3.1 million, is in fact optimum. Right? And, and this is, is something I can do because uh, linear programming has this powerful notion of uh, duality. So what is that? Well, let's just first look at our specific example here. And I'll give you a very specific observation. I'm going to give you what you can think of as a certificate of optimality. OK? I'm going to give you a certificate of optimality for that set of numbers. And here's how I'm going to do it. So, is there a short certificate? I can imagine giving you a long proof that a particular linear programming algorithm always gives you the minimum answer, the optimum answer. Walk through that, execute that algorithm uh, on this particular example, and then you're convinced, of course, that uh, the solution is going to be optimum. But for this specific example, I want to give you a certificate. It's, this certificate isn't going to work for other examples. It's going to be short because it only works for this example, but it won't work for other ones. Okay? And so how do I do that? So the answer is, in fact, there is a certificate that shows that the LP solution is optimal. And consider that I compute this particular algebraic quantity where um, all I've done is I've taken these three equations 
and I've uh, multiplied them by these magical constants. And so I'm not going to tell you how we get this certificate of optimality, but I'm going to give you the certificate, and it's going to be clear that it's a certificate of optimality. And if I take these three equations here, 1, 2, and 3, right, so when I refer to um, 1, 2, and 3, they refer to the equations. These are equations or constraints. And so I take that, and obviously, if I have a bunch of equations and I multiply them out, I can certainly add them up, and I get another equation at the end of it. right? And it's all going to be linear. And if I do that, I get x1 plus x2 plus 140 divided by 222 times x3 plus x4. Right? So that, that's what happens to the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is, uh, you'll recognize this quantity, five zeros, divided by 111. Okay? That's what you get. Um, so now can someone tell me why, last step, why this is a certificate of optimality? The fact that, obviously, this is all algebra, once I've discovered the coefficients. So now that I've done this, why have I just shown you that um, 31, 3.1 million divided by 111 is, in fact, optimum? Can someone tell me this? Look at what you have on the left-hand side. No? Yeah? Any other solution? But I want you to relate that to the, to relate that to, what am I spending? Yeah, but I mean that, this was a claim. This was a claim, and at this point, an unproven claim. It was an unproven claim. Yeah, go ahead. Correct. And what is x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, to be clear? Yeah, exactly. The thing you're trying to minimize. Exactly. Right. You're almost there. Uh, uh, but the key observation here is that x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 is greater than or equal to x1 plus x2, because all of these are positive quantities, remember. 140 divided by 222, two, two, that's less than 1. x3 plus x4. Correct? So given that, I can say that this is greater than or, or, uh, or equal to 3,100, zeros, 1, 1, 1. Right? It's, it's because of this observation that it's a certificate of uh, optimality. Right? Uh, she has her head down. OK. Great. Um, so that's pretty cool. Right? Um, just cooked up these uh, coefficients from somewhere, pulled them out of a hat. You're all convinced now that uh, the value we got was optimum. Did not run an algorithm. Maybe I ran an algorithm. Of course, you ran an algorithm to get those coefficients. right? How did those coefficients appear? So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, you'll see this likely in a problem set or perhaps in section. But in general, I won't worry too much about duality other than knowing the concept. And this notion of LP duality essentially says that what just happened wasn't a coincidence. You can do this all the time. There will always be, for a linear program, a short certificate of optimality that corresponds to some set of coefficients that you can do this particular math with by taking these linear constraints, multiplying them out, adding them up together, and showing that you have a lower bound on, in the case of, um, of uh, this, this problem. You can't, uh, you can't get lower than this. And therefore, for a minimization problem, when you reach that, you clearly found the optimal. Okay? And that's the notion of LP duality. And the basic theorem, and this is really more as an FYI, we won't prove this theorem, is that if you had the standard form for the LP, 
which I'm just writing down again here, where you had ax less than b, um, x vector greater than or equal to 0. So that's identically what I had up here or down here corresponding to the standard LP form. Well, there's a dual. This is what's called the primal form. Usually, if you don't, don't uh, say it, you think of it as a primal form. And if it's dual, you call it a dual. And this is a primal form of LP. This is a dual form of LP or a dual LP. And the dual LP uh, flips everything. And it's not just negation, but transpose. And the actual variables also swap functionalities. So it's really pretty cool. So your, your max turns into a min. The C gets replaced by the B, which is on the right hand side of the inequalities. And um, your uh, constraints are A transpose Y greater than or equal to C. So there's a flip there as well. And Y is greater than or equal to 0. Right? So um, there's a bunch of things that's going on here. And uh, these two problems um, end up uh, being equivalent. Right? The primal and the, and the dual, you can always do this. Right? And uh, essentially, uh, what uh, is happening here um, is that you're solving these two problems simultaneously. And there's lots of algorithms that keep flipping between these two forms for efficiency. Uh, but ultimately, what ends up happening is you see that the, uh, the actual uh, constraints that you had here corresponding to, to the B constraints uh, turn into the B ends up in the, in the cost function here. And that's essentially what's happening out here with respect to multiplying uh, these uh, equations out with particular coefficients. All right? So uh, as I said, this is really uh, more as an FYI. This is an, uh, obviously interesting and, and an interesting uh, uh, proof of optimality, which is a different kind of proof from proving an algorithm correct and uh, applying that proof to a particular instance. And that's the kind of thing that happens in LP, especially when you flip from uh, primal and dual forms. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a sense of uh, how we can uh, convert to standard form so you can apply a, a, an algorithm that, uh, for example, you're, you have a program and it only requires standard form. It runs on standard form. Uh, let's go over really quickly. This is uh, not going to take very long. Uh, a translation from different kinds of LPs. And we had a slightly different one here for our political problem that had a minimization. And how would we convert that to standard form? So there's probably just one conversion here that's uh, tricky. So suppose I want to minimize minus 2x1 plus 3x2. Um, and I want to convert to standard form. All I have is a standard LP solver. What do I do? Should be easy. What do I do if I, if, if I had a solver that was maximizing, but I want to minimize a quantity? Just switch the signs, right? right? So negate to 2x1 minus 3x2 and maximize. So that was easy. Um, this is a tricky one. Suppose xj does not have a non-negative activity constraint. So it just happens to be the case that it's not dollars, uh, but uh, it's uh, some other quantity that can go negative. Um, it might be profit or loss. So, uh, so that quantity rep represents profit or loss, so it could go negative if it's loss. Right? So I don't have this constraint in my original problem specification, but my standard form and my LP solver requires this entire vector to be non-negative. All right? 
So I got a problem here. I can't use my standard solver because of this non-negativity constraint. So how do I fix that? Um, how do I, I turn it into a problem that allows the standard solver to be used? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Perfect. Great. That's good. There you go. Um, so what you do here is take xj and replace it with, let's say, xj prime minus xj double prime. And you have xj prime greater than or equal to 0, xj double prime greater than or equal to 0. But depending on the particular values in whatever solution you're exploring or the final solution, you may have an actual xj value that's negative or positive. All right, so you've added an extra variable here to uh, your linear program. Um, and uh, a couple more real quick. Suppose we have an equality constraint corresponding to x1 plus x2 equals 7. What do I do with an equality constraint where I have x1 plus x2 equals 7? Right? Yeah, go ahead. No, you can't do less than or equal to. But then you can flip the sign. Ah, then you can flip the sign. So you have two, you have, you have two steps there. Good. All right, so you, 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 your less than or equal to needs another multiplier. Uh, so what you end up doing is something like um, x1 plus x2 greater than or equal to 7. And then you need, uh, if you do uh, what uh, the gentleman just said and flip the sign, you get minus x1 minus x2. Um, uh, greater than or equal to minus 7. Right. Is that right? No? I messed up? Oh, I want less than or equal to. You're right. You're right. So, so I need less than or equal to. Uh, oh, that's right. Of course. Thank you. Right. So I need less than or equal to in both places. Right. All right. So. Uh, that's the standard form. I needed less than or equal to. Good. Uh, what you've done is increase the number of constraints by one. All right? Did I get this right? Second time? All right. Uh, so that's pretty much it. The last thing which I won't really write out is, uh, which we've done here already, uh, greater than or equal to constraint uh, translated. I won't give you an example of this. We have this already. Uh, translates to less than or equal to by minus 1 multiply. Right? So we had to invoke that in order to do the equality anyway. Um, so uh, you're in business. If you have a standard LP solver, uh, you can take pretty much uh, any optimization problem that is linear in terms of its objective function and has linear constraints, and you can transform it into LP. If you had nonlinear constraints, um, there's lots of work that goes on in linearizing those constraints and using LP solvers. It's a very practical thing to do. It may be something you'll end up doing, uh, invoking these powerful LP solvers. Typically, they're commercially available. The best ones are, are commercial. And uh, use it to solve your particular problem. It uh, turns your algorithm design problem into a reduction. right? And so you'll spend uh, it's really the next uh, uh, a, a couple of uh, weeks thinking about reductions, we'll start that up right now, where we'll take uh, existing combinatorial problems for which we already know algorithms for, and we're going to reduce them to LP, uh, just to give you a sense of what the power of LP is. Uh, but this notion of reduction is very powerful. You can use it to do complexity proofs. Here, we're just using it as a convenience in today's lecture to use our LP hammer. All right? So um, let's say that. Um, I have uh, our favorite problem of the week, uh, namely uh, max flow, and I want to convert that to uh, uh, LP. So I, I go back a week ago, and uh, right about this time a week ago, and we'd set up the max flow problem. And uh, let's assume that we went back there, 
and we didn't talk about augmenting paths, and we didn't talk about residual capacities uh, or, or uh, min cut or anything like that, but we knew LP already, uh, and uh, we just want to solve max flow using LP. Right? So let's do that. So this is maximum flow. I'm not going to bother with uh, uh, converting to standard form. Uh, we know how to do that, given what we just did here uh, over there. Uh, so I'll just do whatever I want to keep things uh, simple. Uh, max flow is obviously a maximization problem. And using the same notation we, we, we've used, uh, it's not going to look like AX and B, uh, just because uh, I want you to uh, recall what max flow is. And we're going to translate that. And the values of these variables or the names of these variables, whether they're X or F, it shouldn't really matter. Right? We know how to do uh, LP at this point. Uh, or we know how to formulate LP, I should say, at this point. And we're assuming that we have uh, an LP solver. Right? So uh, what I want to do here. The maximum flow problem is maximizing the flow value. Um, and it's simply, you grab the source. You have a variable associated with um, uh, the flow from the source to every other vertex, uh, V. Uh, and uh, you have to uh, maximize that. Right? So that was the setup for max flow. I'm not changing that. Um, what do you think the three constraints or whatever set of constraints that we have here are going to correspond to the LP? Um, you, uh, spent a week on max flow, looked at the problem set. What constraints am I going to have to put up there? I'm going to have to put up capacity constraints. That's, uh, that's an obvious one. Uh, what is another one? Conservation constraints. Right? Uh, all flow uh, entering a node that is not the source or the sink has to leave it. Right? Um, uh, is in the original network, um, is there a, a concept of um, uh, of, of, n of negative flow? No, this, uh, you will define it going in the other direction. So we did talk about negative numbers, et cetera. But uh, uh, you're going to have positive quantities, um, especially if you look at um, net flow, the, the version of the flow that uh, we zoomed in on uh, in uh, the Tuesday lecture from last week. Um, and you also have, uh, uh, in the general setting, you're going to have these skew symmetry constraints as well. So uh, the three things that you need here are skew symmetry, uh, conservation, and capacity. All right. So you have such that f u v equals minus f v u for all u v belonging to v. And depending on the kind of network that you have, um, if you constrain it to uh, a certain type where you don't have these two-way edges, uh, you could uh, certainly remove uh, some, if not all, of these skew symmetry uh, constraints. The important ones are conservation and capacity. And this should seem pretty familiar to you. But the, key, the reason I'm writing these all out is primarily to ensure that you understand that these are all linear constraints. So that's pretty much the only thing that you need to observe here. The, obviously, these constraints you've seen uh, many a time uh, from the two lectures last week. But notice that they're all linear. Right? So, and this finally, this one is f u v uh, less than or equal to c of u v for all u v belonging to cap v. All right. So this is f. That's a variable that's less than another constant, clearly linear. I'm uh, doing a bunch of sums here. Um, I could obviously have uh, multipliers, scalar multipliers. In this case, for conservation, I don't have scalar multipliers. Uh, but uh, it's clearly linear. Uh, skew symmetry, got two variables in here. Uh, one of them is the negation of the other, clearly linear. So that's why this is an LP. Okay. And so you might say, well, I know better. Uh, max flow is uh, much more efficient than any LP solver that's out there. And you would be right. right? Uh, if you have an, a max flow problem of this variety, 
Uh, it's uh, difficult to imagine that you would get performance, empirical performance from running an LP solver. But um, this uh, generalization of max flow, that's a multi-commodity max flow, where you just don't have one commodity flowing through. You may be counting you know, cars and trucks on a road, or you know, there's two different kinds of liquid flowing through the same pipe, um, uh, 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 whatever, um, uh, gas or liquid. And so when you have multiple commodities, uh, you may have a, a linear but more complicated cost function that's uh, a function of the flow of each of the commodities. And they may have a certain weight associated with them. Right? So there's a, a lot of things that could be um, a more general, uh, there could be more general settings corresponding to max flow. And I'll just leave you with the, the thought uh, that you could, you could simply have uh, two commodities. And we'll just call them one and two. And so now you have the F1s and the C1s and the F2s and the C2s. Um, each commodity has to be conserved, right? But what about the capacity? Um, what do you think happens with the capacity? Let's just assume these are, uh, th these are two different kinds of cars. So uh, what would the capacity constraint look like? Exactly, that's right. So good, uh, uh, good point. Um, it may be the case that I have uh, distinct capacities. And in fact, if you have completely disjoint problems, um, uh, you're, you're, you're right in that you can solve them uh, s separately. But uh, actually, the more interesting case uh, would be that you have a single capacity, uh, C. So you'd have, uh, uh, let me just write this out here. If, in fact, you had two distinct things, so if you had F1, C1, F2, C2, uh, the question is, do you have two distinct disjoint optimizations, in which case uh, you just use max flow twice. On the other hand, uh, what's more interesting, really, and I should have used this example for starters, but here's a better one. You have two commodities and a single capacity. So the road is a good example. Both the, the cars and the trucks uh, share the same road. It has a certain capacity. And now your capacity constraint uh, is looking like um, F1 plus F2 uh, over here. Uh, and that's the, uh, the, the flow through the particular edge UV. So you have something like F1 UV plus F2 UV is less than or equal to C UV for this total capacity. All right. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so that is linear, right? The nice thing is it's linear. You could put weights on it. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, to claim that, uh, that a particular commodity, uh, one, uses up because it's a truck, it uses up more uh, space on the road, and you can accommodate fewer of them, uh, you could put a multiplier in there. Still stays linear, right? So that's the power of uh, having an uh, LP uh, engine you could translate problems that are not exactly max flow, they're multi-commodity flow. You may have additional linear constraints that you could add, and you could still use your LP package. Right? So that's the reason why this is uh, interesting and powerful. Um, so, so that was kind of an obvious one, corresponding to max flow. Um, let's, see, let's look at something that's a little less obvious, and it's going to be a, a, a little tricky to convert the shortest path problem are to LP, right? not a lot of work, but one little observation that's going to be important to make in order for the whole thing to flow through or actually work out. So we all know the shortest path problem. Uh, we want to find, let's just call it the single source shortest path problem. You have a specific source that's going to turn into the uh, the, the point from which you're going to start computing uh, the distance, right? That's what Dijkstra does, and that's what uh, Belmont Ford does. 
And so this is from vertex x, s, excuse, excuse me, s. Um, and um, what I want to do here is uh, obviously set it up as a set of linear constraints, right? Um, if I have dv corresponding to the distance from the source, so dv represents the distance from the source, and eventually I want dv to uh, be the shortest distance from the source, right? That's our uh, notation for shortest paths. dv represents an existing path. It may not be the shortest path from s to v, the value of that, but dv monotonically um, uh, decreases um, as you run through. It's initially infinity in, in Dijkstra, going back to Dijkstra, and then we shrink it through a process of relaxation, OK? Now, I want to try and model that. I want to try and model all of this as an LP, right? So it's not immediately obvious. The, the thing that the flow networks had, where we had these constraints. We had capacity constraints and conservation constraints, and we could turn that constraint into an inequality, and uh, it was pretty smooth. It was pretty easy. Right? So uh, what I need to do here with shortest paths is uh, something that's a little more subtle. Right? So what, um, what basic constraint do I have in a shortest path algorithm? What, uh, what, what's an inequality? Do you remember an inequality from shortest paths that we kept talking about? The triangle inequality. Right? So we're going to have to go with the triangle inequality and take the triangle inequality and, and use that to create an LP formulation of shortest paths. Right? In particular, what we have here is that I can write dv minus du is less than or equal to wuv for all uv belonging to E. And that's the triangle inequality. Okay. Um, and I'm going to have d of s equals 0. Right? That's the only thing that I start with. Right. And so what's happening out here is simply that there's different ways of getting to v. And um, my shortest path is going to be the best way of getting to v. So in particular, the way you want to think about this is that if I have a v and I can get to it from, let's just say, u1 and u2, and maybe the source is over here, and these are the only two edges that can get to v. Right? So I'm just looking at a fairly limited setting. u1 and u2 are going to have to be the two vertices. One of these two is going to get me to v. Right? Uh, and I got, a, I got w, u1, uh, v here. And I got w, u2, v over here. Right? And so what this is saying is um, I'm going to have to write this out for uh, each of these edges. For each of these edges, I'm going to uh, have this constraint. And that says that the dv value, if I want the shortest path, um, should obey uh, both of these constraints. And if I want to obey both of these constraints, one of them is going to be my limiting constraint. And I'm going to get the min of those two. Correct? So in effect, what this translates to is I, it's an and, right? So dv minus du1 is less than or equal to w u1 v dv minus du2 is less than or equal to w u2 v. That's an and, because I'm putting both of those constraints in here. And that essentially means that um, uh, dv is going to be the min of uh, the two quantities, uh, the du1 quantity plus the wu1v, and the du2 quantity plus the wu2v. Right? That makes sense? Ask me questions if this is unclear. Right? So that simply corresponds to the fact that I'm doing an and over here. I'm adding all of these constraints in there. So I'm applying the triangle inequality to every edge, to every relationship between a vertex that uh, has a path ending at it 
and you're pushing it forward to this vertex V, all the different ways that you can get to V. In this case, there was uh, two sets of ways, one from U1 and one from U2. And the last step is um, a minimization step. All right? OK, so you think you're done, or we're done, but we're not quite done. Because uh, what's missing here in terms of my formulation of LP? What else do I have to do here? Well, uh, sure. Uh, Non-negative. Uh, let's do that. Sorry? Objective. objective. Who said objective? You again. Um, so we are missing an objective function, right? Uh, now, shortest paths is what kind of problem again? Short means minimum, right? Minimum? Minimum height, whatever. Uh, so do I put a, what happens if I put a minimum in here? And let's say that I do something like sigma over v, cap v, dv, because I want to minimize, or I could pick a particular one. I could pick a particular uh, a single source, single destination, and I put, I put a minimum there. OK. Uh, what happens? Does this work? What's the solution to this problem if I minimize the distance? Zero, because the, the zero value is going to work. Right? Uh, it's, uh, it, so there's something I haven't put in the constraint that I do want a path. I do want a path from um, S to V for any V that matches one of the matches one of the quantities in the min, because the min says I have equality. Right? The big uh, issue here is this is a less than or equal to. And that's why the min doesn't work in the objective function. All right? It's a less than or equal to. But this min over here, which is the definition of a shortest path, is saying that it's either equal to this quantity or equal to that quantity. There's an equality over here that is missing from this side. Right? And that's the key observation. Once you've observed that, that there's, you need equality for one of these con constituent quantities of the, of the min, then uh, you'll see that what you have to do is simply change this min to a max. OK? So you say, well, how the heck did a min change into a max? And I'm not sure I'm going to convince every one of you in the next minute or so. But the bottom line is it comes down to I do have a min already in my inequalities because I'm ending each of these inequalities and I'm putting down each of those inequalities in there. Right? So each of them is going to force me to find the best solution, because they're going to constrain me uh, to not go via u2 if u1 is better, because the other constraint corresponding to u1 is going to force me down. Right? So there's an additional min in there, because of the ending of the less than or equal to's. Uh, and then in order to actually force the equality for one of those, I need to push up as hard as I can or as high as I can. All right? So think about it. Um, play around with a couple of examples. Uh, choose um, uh, a, a simple example for starters. And you'll see that this is the correct formulation. All right? So you can see that uh, it's not completely clear uh, uh, in some cases how to transform problems to LP. But even in those cases, sometimes you can. All right? So this is just a, a ton of different problems, a good uh, uh, skill to have uh, to be able to take combinatorial optimization engines like LP or even MaxFlow and be able to translate problems to them. Uh, this is something that you'll probably do if you uh, stick to algorithms in your uh, careers or uh, exploiting uh, available uh, algorithm packages. So the last thing I want to do here for uh, the rest of the time is to give you some sense for how an LP program is actually uh, 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 optimized. How can you possibly take the standard LP formulation, which is a general setting. You know nothing about shortest paths, let's assume, but nothing about max flow. Um, it's not about a specific problem. It's about the general setting. How can we solve the general setting? Right? Because that was the theme here anyway. You had this engine, uh, and uh, you want to use this engine. But now, how do you build this engine? So what we're going to do is look at a, a, a fairly simple example of the simplex algorithm 
And this algorithm is uh, in the textbook, uh, and it'll be in my notes. So I'll get as far as I can. Uh, it's not that complicated uh, to describe, especially from, a, uh, uh, from an example standpoint. Uh, but uh, I may not get through all of the steps to get you the optimum for this particular uh, example, given uh, how much time we have. The most important uh, concept in uh, simplex is yet another form of representation for simplex, um, which says that you can represent the LP not in standard form, but in slack form. Okay? So I'm going to tell you what slack form is. And then what we're going to do is the flow of simplex, uh, algorithmic flow, is to convert one slack form into an equivalent. Obviously, you don't want to do something that's incorrect, but it has to be an equivalent slack form whose objective value has not decreased and has likely increased. So you're guaranteed that the objective value has not decreased. You're not guaranteed that it's increased. And then we're going to keep going till the optimal solution becomes obvious. Right? And you might say, how is this obvious? That's the reason why I talked about the short certificate of optimality. It is definitely a relationship between uh, the termination uh, of simplex and the fact that you can now say, hey, I know I'm done here. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's kind of obvious that I can't do any better. Right? And hopefully you'll see that by the end of this lecture in this simple example. Um, so that's it. It's an iterative algorithm. Uh, it's exponential. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because this takes um, m plus n, uh, choose n iterations in the worst case, where uh, n is the number of variables and m is the number of constraints. Uh, most of the time, it does a lot better. But that's the only bound that you can actually uh, prove in the worst case. Um, and so uh, you're stuck with an exponential algorithm if you're using simplex, worst case. Uh, we won't actually do much analysis on simplex. Uh, it's really out of scope for 046 uh, in terms of the analysis. The actual algorithm is certainly within scope. So what I want to do is uh, give you some sense for what the slack form looks like. And we'll do a couple of iterations of simplex. And we'll get as far as we can uh, before uh, the end of lecture. So we'll take a different example from our political example. Uh, it's similar in size, uh, and I want to explain to you what the slack form is and why it's interesting. So what I want to do is maximize 3x1 plus x2 plus x3 um, subject to the constraints that x1 plus x2 plus 3x2 is less than or equal to 30. 2x1 plus 2x2 plus 5x3 is less than or equal to 24. Um, 4x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 less than or equal to 36. And then uh, non-negativity constraints, x1, x2, x3 greater than or equal to 0. All right, so that's our, uh, that's our example problem. I'll leave it up there. Um, we're going to convert this to slack form. Right? And so what is the slack form? We're going to introduce um, an additional number of variables that correspond to the number of equations that we have. So we're going to introduce, uh, in this case, three new variables because I have three equations. And the slack form for this pr problem looks like this. I'm going to have z equals um, 3x1 plus x2 plus x3, same as before. And then I'm going to have uh, variables that represent, these are called basic variables. And the original variables are called non-basic variables. So I'm going to add three basic variables, x4, x5, and x6. 
corresponding to these three constraints. And they're going to represent slack in the sense that they're going to correspond to how much slack you have in the inequalities that you have in the original problem. So um, if x4 happens to be 0, then you're jammed up. You have no slack. Because um, x1 plus x2 plus 3x3 equals 30. And um, increasing any one of them will violate the constraint. Okay, so that's just simply the notion of slack. It's how much room do we have? Do you have um, x5 is 24 minus 2x1 minus 2x2 minus 5x3, and uh, the last one is 36 minus 4x1. This is already mechanical up until this point, and so I'll call this set of equations equations one, and um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to now um, work on a space that corresponds to x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. So I'm going to have these solutions that now have six values associated with them, as opposed to just three values, because I've added three variables, the basic variables, to my non-basic set. Right? So the original variables are, are non-basic just to differentiate. Um, so, so far, it's just set up. It's uh, definitions. Um, we can uh, think about uh, running through iterations of uh, simplex. It takes about three iterations here in order to get to the point where the optimum is obvious. So you're going to convert through uh, three slack forms. And then finally, when you get to this uh, fourth slack form, uh, you see that uh, you have an optimum solution. And how does that work? Um, we're going to have the notion of a basic solution um, where we set all non-basic variables to 0. So um, in this case, uh, what we're going to have, and then we're going to compute uh, values of the basic variables. Right? So um, our objective function here is going to be 3 times 0 plus 1 times 0 plus 2 times 0, which is obviously 0. Um, and um, the values on um, x4, of course, is going to be uh, uh, because all of these are 0, it's going to be 30. x5 is going to be 24. And x6 is going to be 36. So this is kind of a trivial starting point. Right? So you can think of this as 0, 0, 0, the solution that you're looking at, 30, uh, 24, and 36. Right? So that's our, uh, our, our starting point, uh, which doesn't really tell you much. Uh, but now comes the key step where we're going to do something that's called pivoting. And in pivoting, you're going to swap a basic variable with a non-basic variable. Right? It is a, a, a step that requires some intelligence, uh, but the basic step is a swap. So one of the basic variables is going to become a non-basic variable, and vice versa. Okay? And uh, how do we uh, select this? Uh, initially, you can kind of do this in an arbitrary way. Uh, it gets uh, a, a, a little more subtle as you go along. Uh, you don't want to uh, uh, do things in, uh, in a random way. But um, let's just start with uh, what pivoting actually does in a more generic setting. Uh, the, the basic step is select a non-basic uh, variable let's call it x sub e, whose coefficient in the objective function is positive. Um, you can always redefine things if you uh, can't find something like that. But we won't go there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to increase the value of xe 
as much as possible. And we always have constraints, of course. Uh, so we can do that without violating any of the constraints. And then at this point, um, variable xc becomes basic. So it's going to turn into the left-hand side. It's going to move over. You're going to swap the x1 might be over here, uh, over here, and uh, you got to rewrite these equations so the x1 becomes basic, for example, over to the left-hand side, and uh, the variable that it replaced goes over to the right-hand side. So you can think of this as Gaussian elimination except with inequalities. Uh, there's definitely relationships there, uh, if you recall uh, your Gaussian elimination. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, so xc uh, becomes basic, and some other variable uh, becomes non-basic. Right? Um, the values of other basic variables and the objective function may change. All right. So we'll do, we'll do one pivot step, at least, so you get a sense for the algebra involved, and it get, becomes a little more concrete. Um, to motivate you further, you'll be doing this in problem set 8 on a different example. So what we're going to do here is um, we're going to uh, select um, a non-basic variable. So let's just select x1, right? Lexicographic order or numeric order. Uh, let's, let's select x1 is uh, selected. That's the non-basic variable. Um, and what I want to do is, uh, is increase the value of x1. Right? So I want to increase it without violating constraints. Now, which of these constraints do you think is going to cause trouble first with respect to increasing the value of x1? x1 is now 0. Right? We're at a ground uh, level. I uh, have uh, all zeros, uh, things are feasible. Now, as I start increasing x1, um, you remember you have non-negativity constraints associated with um, uh, each of the x4 values as well. That's what these basic variables represent. Right? So don't forget the fact that um, the constraints are violated. Uh, you need all the x size to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? Uh, that was true for the non-basic variables. It's also true for the basic variables. Right? So a violation of a constraint implies that one of the currently basic variables goes negative. Right? That's exactly equivalent to the original uh, inequality not being satisfied. So which of these constraints do you think is going to cause trouble here? Just look at it and should be able to look at the three equations and tell me, as I increase the value of x1, where am I going to hit my limit? Uh, x6, yes, absolutely correct. So that's because of the minus 4 here. This is a big multiplier. I got a 1, a minus 1 here, a minus 2 here, and a minus 4 here. Um, and if you just look at 4, uh, the magnitudes, 4 is bigger than 2 and it's bigger than 1. So it's going to be that third constraint. So uh, third constraint, you can obviously compute this numerically or mechanically. Uh, it was just easier to do this uh, in this example by eyeballing it. Uh, and so third constraint is the tightest one. And uh, it limits how much we can I increase x1. So I'm going to do my second step up there, which corresponds to rewriting um, x1 as these other variables. And now I got x1 on the left-hand side and x6 on the right-hand side. And now it's just merely a matter of substitution. Right? Once I've done this, I'm just going to jam through and go in, and I'm going to rewrite uh, uh, the other equations with x6 
on the right hand side. And that is, I'm going to replace x1 with the above equation. That's really a simple substitution. Right? So at this point, what's happened is, uh, because the third constraint representing x6 was the one that was chosen, what's happened is that x1 and x6 are going to interchange roles. Okay? x1 was non-basic. It's going to become basic. Um, x6 was basic, and it's going to become non-basic. Right? And that's uh, basically the essence of the simplex algorithm. The iteration and then the convergence and all of that uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, going to require uh, getting to a point where the optimality is obvious. But we won't be doing any proofs uh, corresponding to convergence uh, in, for simplex or any other specific LP techniques um, uh, in, in this class. Uh, maybe some constraint techniques. I take back what I said, but certainly not for simplex. Uh, but I just want to give you a sense for uh, the flow here. And so let's just go through this last thing here in terms of finishing off the pivot exercise. And uh, I want to show you what the equations look like. And if you just keep doing that, at some point, you'll converge. Right? And so what happens here is you have z equals 27 plus x2 divided by 4 plus x3 divided by 2 minus 3x6 divided by 4. Um, x1 equals, so there's a, there's a bunch of algebra here that I'm obviously skipping over. Um, but it's simple algebra. And I have x4 over here, 21 minus 3x2 divided by 4, minus 5x3 divided by 2, plus x6 divided by 4. And then one last thing here. Okay. All right, so that's my the, uh, pivot step where I flipped x1 and x6. So now you ask, what was the point? Right? What was the point of this? Well, the point of this was that you actually increased the objective function value, and in this particular case, quite significantly, while maintaining correctness. And so let me just make these observations and conclude here, because then that gets us to the point where you've seen the details of one pivot step, and you can imagine applying it over and over uh, to convergence. And let's just say, let's just look at the original basic solution, which, uh, as you recall, was 0, 0, 0, 30, 24, and 36. And this is simply x1 through x6. Um, this original basic solution certainly satisfies these equations, equations 2, if you just put them in there. And uh, it makes sense that it would have the objective value of 0, given equivalence. But you can verify that by seeing that you have 27. The original had the objective value of 0 because all the x1, x2, x3 were 0. So that was an easy check in the set of equations corresponding to the first set, which I've erased at this point. Uh, but uh, uh, that, no matter. And if you look at what I have here, I have 36 equals uh, 0. Right? So the objective value here is 0. It matches what you had before. Uh, but the basic solution for 2 um, I'm going to set the non-basic values. So what is the solution here? I'm, uh, the non-basic values are 0. So the solution is going to be 9 because 9 is uh, uh, non-basic. x1 is now non-basic. x2 and x3 are still basic. And then I have 21 and 6. And x6 now has become basic. So the way I get the solution is simply by plugging in zeros on this side. Okay? And I get 9, 21, and 6 because I just plugged in zeros on the right-hand side. 
So that's how I got a new solution. And if you look at the objective value uh, for this, the objective value, um, you can look at this objective value simply by looking at the original problem. And the original problem uh, had a pre x1 plus x2 plus x3 as the objective value. And so if you go off and you see, well, there you got zeros for the other ones, but you have 3 times um, 9. So you have an objective value of 27. Right? So this flip of our pivot uh, basically got you from an objective value of 0 while maintaining correctness to an objective value of 27. Okay? And um, you can look at this in the notes or in CLRS, but you have to do two more pivots corresponding to two other variables, the same grungy stuff that I went through here, substitution after selection, and the objective value is going to increase. And you might ask, how do I know that I'm done? Right? Uh, and so that was the last thing here, which is um, increase the value until uh, it becomes obvious. Uh, no, this was pivoting, I'm sorry. Uh, increase the value uh, until uh, pivot until it becomes obvious what the, uh, what the optimum is. And uh, what ends up happening is uh, you end up with an objective function in this case. The objective function, mind you. This thing over here is the objective function. And notice that it has a negative coefficient on the, the variable that was actually the the part of the first pivot, right? So x1 and x6 were part of the first pivot, and this got a negative coefficient. So what ends up happening here is you end up getting something like 30 minus uh, something, minus something, minus something, where you have um, xi values over here. And when you set these to be 0, that's the best you can do, because these are all negative quantities, all right? So I'll just leave you with that. Um, hopefully you understood how we do the pivoting. Uh, chug through it three times, and then you get that objective function, and the optimum value is 30. See you next time.